Thank you, choir. That was absolutely beautiful. We are brought so wonderfully every Sunday into the presence of God by the gifts that you share. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come this morning, as you well know, with our hearts carrying numerous concerns, anxieties, reasons why we need to be busy. And so, grant that we might set all that aside, that the busyness that rules our lives might rest outside the doors of this sanctuary for this brief time, and that we might be able to hear and to experience the truth of your great love and your great forgiveness as we hear these ancient words of scripture. In Christ's name, amen. Our Old Testament the les lesson this morning is taken from 1 Samuel. This is the story of Goliath. <clears throat> Listen now for the word of the Lord, please. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Demon, and encamped in the valley of Elah, and formed ranks about the against the Philistines. I'm sorry, Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a, fan, a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze sl slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear head weighed 600 shekels of iron and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. In our New Testament lesson for this morning, we continue in the Gospel of Mark. And as you heard in the children's story, we come to the time when Jesus stills the storm. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks. 
So, how many of you, when you were a child, were afraid of the dark? Oh, tell the truth. <laughs> I think most of us have been afraid of the dark at one time or another when we were growing up. You know, you, you're in this room, all the lights are turned out, everybody's gone to bed, gone to sleep, and you're lying there in that bed, and your imagination runs wild. You get so frightened that you just can't stand it anymore, and you burst out crying. Whereupon, your mom and your dad come into the room, and perhaps one of them sits on the side of the bed and lifts you up out of the bed, sits you on their lap, says, shh, hush now. It's all right. There's nothing to be afraid of. Maybe huggles you close, rocks you back and forth just a little bit. Hush now. It's all right. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. Well, if I tell the truth, if you were me at that stage and it happened, you wouldn't believe a word of what your parents were saying because you absolutely knew the snakes were crawling in the bed, they were going to eat you up, and there was nothing anybody could do about it. <laughs> I still think those snakes were there. There's nothing to be afraid of. We say it to comfort or to encourage. We say it to soothe anxiety or calm panic. And we say it not just to children, but we say it to each other. We say those words without actually thinking about what we're saying. We say them with the best of intentions, with a really good heart. But there's nothing to be afraid of. Hmm. Let's be honest with one another this morning. That just is not true. There are plenty of things to be afraid of. There's loneliness and isolation. There's sickness and there's pain and there's grief. There's that frightening diagnosis or your company is downsizing which is a nice way of saying that you are losing your job I mean there are names in our culture today that all we have to do is say those names and we begin to get frightened all over again for example 9-11 the Charleston 7 Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, Orlando, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada, Hermit, Hurricanes, Irma, and then Marie, and our own October floods. Or it might be a late night knock at the door with a solemn-faced, uniformed man standing on the other side of the door. Is there anyone we can call to be with you? Or it might be a doctor who looks at you but can't quite meet your eyes and says, there's really nothing more that we can do. Friends, don't tell me there's nothing to be afraid of. I absolutely know there's plenty to be afraid of. And you know what? Jesus didn't say that either. Jesus didn't say there's nothing to be afraid of. Time and again in Scripture, the word is not there's nothing to be afraid of. The word is do not be afraid. I mean, that's the word that the angel spoke to those terrified shepherds on the hillside at the very beginning of the gospel story. And th that's the word that was spoken to the women as they stood in confusion before the empty tomb. Folks, there's a chasm between there's nothing to be afraid of and don't be afraid. And when I think about those disciples on that boat, 
I realized there was plenty for them to be afraid of. I mean, there was this ferocious storm, and they, they were seasoned sailors, fishermen who knew the waters and the weather when they fished. They were, they were big men, strong men. They had to be in order to do their profession. You know what? It must have been one humdinger of a storm to frighten them so much that they just couldn't keep quiet. Oh, and by the way, there's Jesus in the back of the boat. He's lying down. His head is on a pillow. He's sleeping soundly. Well, the only thing the disciples could do was try, really try, try to keep from calling out. And the winds got worse, and the uh, rain got worse, and so they are frantically bailing water out of that little boat so that it doesn't sink, and they're wrestling with that wind-tossed sail, and they are literally hanging on for dear life. There's darkness and noise, and their hearts are pounding, and like frightened children, they simply cannot hold back a cry for help. Jesus, wake up. Can't you see we're drowning? Wake up. We're about to perish. We're about to die. Wake up. Well, I feel like that a lot these days. God, wake up. I'm bailing as fast as I can. It's dark here, and I am alone. Wake up and make it all go away. As I was reading, studying for this sermon this morning, I came across a suggestion that caught my attention, and I'd like to share it with you this morning. Though we might prefer it to be different, I suggest to you this morning that this story is not primarily about Jesus' control over the weather. In fact, if you read the scriptures carefully, Jesus sounds a little grumpy when he wakes up. And I don't blame him. The man's exhausted. Why can't these fishermen handle their, their boat? But he's, he wakes up. And while he can indeed still any storm, he has that power. That is not the power that he came to demonstrate. It is not the power that he himself personifies. I mean, this is a miracle story, make no doubt about it. But perhaps when we come to it, we might understand it a little better if we understand it as a story about our struggles, our struggles to believe that the Lord God Almighty is actually in the boat with us. You know, maybe our call is to look deeply into our own faith and to struggle with whether or not we are able to trust a God with us, Emmanuel, whether we're able to trust that God enough, whether or not we actually would prefer a fix-it God. Fix-it God. Make it go away, God. Fix it. It's nice to have Jesus in that waterlogged boat, experiencing the same terrible storm, overwhelming waves. But is it enough? It should be. But is it enough? The disciples struggled with that very question. And I suggest that we do too. We struggle to comprehend the power of God, the paradoxical, 
utterly strange, alien beyond our culture's understanding, kind of power that is God's power. God's power is shown to us in the power of relationship and of covenant. Instead of forcing solutions on us, God's power is revealed because God comes alongside us, journeys with us, suffers with us, stays in the boat with us. Out of love for us and out of longing for us, God became one of us. And God's power is revealed because God shares it with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't exercise God's power by being a puppet master. God doesn't exercise God's power most of the time with miraculous intervention or preemptive strikes in a cosmic war. Rather, God's power is made known to us in an invitation, an invitation from God that says, come to me and build with me through my power a kingdom, a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of love, a kingdom of justice. God says, come, and together we will build something wonderful right here, right now in this world. Jesus, don't you care? I care enough to stay in the boat with you. Amen. Let us stand now and affirm what it is that we believe using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed.